G'day, thanks for joining us on our US property training video. Got quite a bit of stuff to cover here. I think you'll find this very interesting. So grab yourself a cuppa or a glass of your favorite drink and settle back and uh, let's get down and get started. First of all, quick disclaimer, uh, just make sure you understand the information we give here is of general nature um, and not to be mistaken as investment advice. Please make sure you contact your licensed professionals, uh, accountants, uh, financial planners. I definitely keep my professionals very close uh, when I'm discussing any of these deals. So uh, yeah, please, I recommend you do the same. Who's this training for? Well, look, if you're interested in expanding your investment portfolio or adding some high cash flow properties to your portfolio, uh, not sure what the local market's like uh, or how much cost to get involved, then this is perfect. If you're looking to get started investing full stop, trying to find you know equity and funds to get started, um, look, you know, you're finding the savings account, offset accounts uh, not working hard enough for you, then this could be a great option as well. If you want to create a passive income, then you're not going to be able to do too much better than property, that's for sure. If you have a lifestyle goal in mind, travel with the family, purchase weekend getaway or land, or maybe you just want to work less hours, then if any of these resonate for you, then this is definitely training that you want to have a look at. By the end of this presentation, We'll go through a number of things. First of all, we'll show you how you can invest in great positive cash flow properties to generate good passive income, additional to whatever you're currently doing in Australia. So whether you're, you're working, you've got a business, you already have investments. Uh, this can be done all on the side and in addition to all of that. We'll show you two principles to ensure that you will find solid investments with great returns in the US. I wanted to bulk some falsehoods that the media feed us about what we, what they believe is the right way to invest <clears throat> and how to avoid the scams and the pitfalls that seem to be rife, unfortunately, in international investing. The options and the strategies that work in the US market, now this is a really, a really key point. You really want to uh, take a look at this. You wanna make sure that we do use options and strategies that you do find them that, that work in the market. Something that works here in Australia does not necessarily work in the US. And number five, how to get a team of professionals on the ground that you can trust and rely on to support you in your investing in the US. And again, another, another real critical point, and we'll go through all of this for you. Best of all, you'll see that investing in the US market done right, can be one of the safest, most securest and highest cash flow investments you can make right now. But again, you need to do it correctly. And that's what we're here to show you. All right, one of the questions I often get asked is, how much capital is required? How much do you need to invest? You know, maybe, maybe I don't have $500,000 or $600,000. Well, the good news is it is quite affordable. It's actually less than a quarter of what you might think it is and you really, really can develop some really good incomes for a lot less than you think. Let me show you. Let's just say for argument's sake that one house is worth $10,000 a year to you. Now this is a, a generalization of course, but, but quite doable. This is, is, is quite a very good example. So we'll just say that one house is worth 10,000. So what we do is we can show you a three year plan how in the next three years you can buy five investment properties. So like we said, each one is worth $10,000 cash flow. That means that overall you're looking at a $50,000 a year bonus or boost to your income at the moment. Now that's something that can really help. That, that is something that will loosen the purse strings, I'm sure. On the flip side, we have a five year plan where we can show you how in five years you can get 10 investment properties. $10,000 per property will give you $100,000 per year cash flow boost to your current income. Now that is something that, that really can make a difference. Uh, you could literally start looking at maybe possibly giving up or not working as hard or something along those lines uh, with that sort of income. So the property market in Australia, I'm sure you probably know this, I'll run through this really quickly. It's very difficult to get into. The costs are prohibitive, it's very expensive. So that, that's probably one of the major uh, hurdles or, or, or roadblocks that a lot of people find when trying to get into the Australian property market. The returns, your cash flow returns can be very hard. It can be very expensive. Um, by the time you buy the property, your rental return, if it is even positive and, and negative gearing, don't get me started, but um, can be one, 2% if you're lucky. 
Our market on a whole is in quite a boom state. Now, we have, over the last 18 months, had quite a, a soften, but, but at, at the end of the day, especially with the interest rates dropping again, you know, really the, the, the prices are still going to go up. It, it really is going to be quite hot. And, you know, with a very expensive housing market like we've got, if you're not already in and have already built good equity, it can be really hard to get in. Negatively geared investments. So, you know, in a lot of cases, people will buy property and it will cost them money every month rather than earn them money every month in the hope that it continues up. You know, now really, at the end of the day, we would call this the buy and hope strategy. You are buying a property and you are hoping that this property goes up in value. Now, in Australia, over the last dozen years, you've probably been pretty right. But you can't use this strategy all the time. You can't even use it in Australia all the time. Why US? What's the difference? Well, firstly, they are a politically stable country that welcomes foreign investors. Now, I understand a lot of people sort of laugh at me when I say politically stable and, and whatever you think of Donald Trump. Uh, on the other hand, he really does have, he has done some good things for their economy. Um, it's quite interesting to, to watch him, but, uh, but yeah, he's, he's done some good things and, and the country as a whole does welcome foreign investment. There's some really new growth in the markets. The, the GFC hit them pretty hard and I'll go through that in a minute, but um, there is some growth areas in, in a lot of areas throughout the Midwest of the US that, that are really, really good. There's some really high quality properties you can get at affordable prices and very good cash flow positive returns. So whereas in Australia we were talking about 2 or 3%, in the US we look at 10 to 12% and that's the difference. The US is also enjoying a strong economic growth at the moment. Their wages are still increasing, their unemployment rate is still improving. Um, at the moment they're going, they're just again having a little bit of a softening just in the last couple of months. And I know Trump's been really uh, hard on this uh, trade war with China. But, but again, you know, at the moment their, their economy is still going along very nicely. And the US dollar uh, at the moment is still relatively weak. Now, having said that, I think we've just dropped down to about 67 cents at the moment. But again, really where we are in Australia, I think that that's probably going to drop down a little bit even further. But the benefit of the exchange rates is, of course, if it drops further, then what happens is the returns that you get from the properties in the US is actually grows. So. As we said, <clears throat> it's a very different market. It's a, multi, a melting pot of a multiple different markets. And I, I guess in Australia, we do have the same, but probably not to the degree that they have in the US. The East Coast, the West Coast, these can be very expensive markets. If you're looking at property in California, particularly Los Angeles, San Francisco, San Diego, Seattle, if you're looking at the East Coast, uh, probably you know uh, New York, Washington, Boston, Miami, you're probably looking at properties that would cost you the same as they would in Sydney, Melbourne, in a city, something like that. On the other hand, in the Midwest of the US, there, there is, if you draw a line down on the West Coast, uh, you've got the Rocky Mountains going down through Colorado. On the East Coast, you've got the Appalachians. Anywhere in between those two mountain ranges is a, is a massive area of about 30 to 40 states of the US, which would have each probably five or six capital cities or five or six cities that you can invest in. All of them are very good uh, opportunities, some very good markets in there, quite flat, very affordable, very good cash flow pricing. The global financial crisis really did hit them very hard. So, in, And there was a lot of areas, particularly in the Midwest, that did drop significantly. And, and over 24 million homes went into foreclosures, which is incredible amounts. There were seven banks failed, um, three of which I think were bought by some of the bigger banks and four of them just closed up. So there's people that are literally still in their homes today that the bank has never foreclosed on them because the bank went broke. You know, and, and, and with that number of, of homes, that gives so much opportunity to get in. A lot of homeowners were in trouble. Um, they had to sell. Um, the markets are now though rebounding. So it's really got an opportunity to, to get at some of those distressed properties, the properties that haven't, that, uh, haven't uh, had anybody in them for some time. We can buy these, do these up and, and really now make the best benefit of a rebounding market. The banks are still working through millions of foreclosures that they were working on. So sometimes it's, it can be another opportunity to get some very good cheap foreclosures. Rental demand in the US is very strong because there were so many homeowners in trouble with that first point there. A lot of people now are shy, uh, sort of gun shy to buy a house. So what they do is they rent or they understand they have to move regularly to keep a good job or take or where their kids go to school. So again, they rent. So the rental demand in the US is extremely strong. 
And the growth is beginning to come back in a number of different markets. In the west, west Coast and East Coast, as I said before, it's already come back. But in the Midwest, it's really starting to grow. Where should you invest? Well, that's a good question. I mean, really, at the end of the day, you could really look anywhere. Uh, Michigan, Ohio, Illinois, Tennessee, Florida, Texas. There's so many options. Any of the Midwest states, anywhere. You know, if you stay off the coasts, although even the coastal markets can be very good, you just need to make sure you're very careful and there's a lot more yeah, at stake. But in the Midwest areas, there's, there's such a, a vast variety. There's a number of different ways, though, that you can actually look at to try and find out the markets that you should invest in. So let me go through that. And, and so you can narrow this down. You can, you can do your own research and, and determine what you want. So when you're looking at particular areas, there's a criteria that you should use. And, and these are the five points that I, that I look at here. Uh, probably in this order, actually. And, and number one, I think, is city infrastructure. So the first thing you want to look at is you want to look at areas where the city or the councils in the US are actually building new infrastructure. They're investing dollars. Because if the city is investing dollars in that area, then you know the area is going to be relatively good. The city isn't going to invest in areas that, they, that people are leaving or that there's, that, that there's trouble in, in those areas. They're going to look for areas where they know they're going to get a return. They know that there's going, to be, there's going to be some good growth in that area. They're the guys that are on the ground. So if the cities know that this area is good, then that's the areas I try to follow. The second thing to look for, of course, is employment. Now, we'd probably do the same here in Australia. You wouldn't be investing in high unemployment areas. And it's the same in the US. So you want to make sure the employment rate is solid. Good opportunity for jobs, uh, good growth for jobs. Uh, you want to know areas where there's good blue collar work as well as white collar. So, you know, you want to look in, in, in good solid rental areas. Schools and universities, I mentioned just previously, are also excellent. Firstly, they're actually very good employers, so, for, so they meet criteria number two. But secondly, again, the US market is such a high capitalist society that we understand now that people know that they need to send their kids to a good school because they need to get a good education. The good education is going to give their kids a good opportunity to get a good job. Without a job in the US, you're just about lost. Um, there's so few uh, opportunities to get um, health care and, and, and insurances and all this sort of thing that we get here in Australia. So it really does make a big difference. Crime rate is another one. Um, you want to try and have a look at the crime rate and make sure that you know, you're not buying in high crime areas. That's, that's another thing that can be a good indication. And of course, the last one which we look at here is, is vacancy rate. Now, having said that, what you will generally find is those bottom two, crime rate and vacancy rate, are actually more of a symptom of the top three missing. So if you find an area where there's no city infrastructure, the city's not building anything, their, their roads are in poor condition, their bridges are in poor condition, there's, there's poor hospitals or poor police. If you find that there's not a lot of employment opportunity in this area, there's, there's really not a lot for people to do and a very high unemployment rate, there's no good schools, no good universities, you will then find that the crime rate is going to be high and that the vacancy rate is going to be high. And, and really, so they go hand in hand. Having said that, you do want to check those off your list as you go. All right. So now you've picked your area, you've gone through the criteria, you said, right, what type of properties now do I need to look for in the areas that I'm looking at? Okay. So there's actually a bunch of different, there's four different strategies or properties that you can look at. One of the most popular, I guess, is investing in single family residences. Now, this is probably what you'd recognise here in Australia. This is your three or four bedroom house, two bathrooms, picket fence, um, you know, one family move in, you tenant the property. Most popular, easiest to manage. You also get a lot more choices. There's, there's a lot more opportunities on the market to get for this particular case. So these can be very good. Once again, you want to make sure that there's some minimum return targets, and I'll go through that in a minute. But the properties can be uh, very good solid properties. You can buy distressed properties, do them up, and you can tenant them, or you can buy good quality properties already in good condition with, all, with tenants in place. Either way, the strategies do work, uh, and single family can be a really good one to start with. On the flip side of that coin is what we call multifamily residences. Now, this is a little more different. We don't get a lot of this in Australia. This could be duplexes or triplexes or even quadplexes, three or four families living in the same property. 
what you might have is you might have an upstairs which has say two bedrooms one bathroom and a kitchen and you might have downstairs which has two bedrooms one bathroom and a kitchen and they rent out upstairs and you rent out downstairs the advantage to this of course is you're going to get slightly higher returns so going back before to your single family you'll find in that particular case there that you're getting let's say you get twelve hundred dollars for a single family four bedroom property now let's say you take a four bedroom multifamily, you've got two bedrooms upstairs, two bedrooms downstairs, you're probably gonna be able to get maybe around say $800 for each unit. So $800 for upstairs, $800 for downstairs. So therefore your return from that property is going to be $1,600 a month, not the $1,200 a month that you're gonna get from the single family. Same sort of property. A Little more complexity in managing it. You're managing two tenants, you're managing two families. There's a little bit more and there's not as many of them as available, but uh, they can be a really good strategy, particularly if you're looking for really high cash flow. Now, the next step up from that, of course, would be unit blocks. Now, unit blocks can be excellent investments and they have higher returns again. Once again, you buy a block of five, six, seven units. In the US, very few of these unit blocks are strata titled. So when so you don't buy one unit, you buy the entire block of seven. Um, I probably would tend to, to drive people away from condominiums. Now condominiums are essentially units that are strata titled. Generally you will find in condominiums there's some very high homeowner association fees. Now HOA fees are equivalent to our body corporate here in Australia. And, and in often case, you can find that you might be getting eight, nine hundred or a thousand dollars a month rent for your condominium and paying five, six hundred dollars a month in homeowner association fees. So it can really, really dig really hard into your returns. Unit blocks are different. You're buying the entire unit block. There's no homeowner fees at all. Um, but it is more complexity though, and they do cost a little more money. But a unit block, you could be looking at getting 20, 25% return from those units, which is fantastic return. Uh, you need to allow for some vacancy. So in a unit block of seven block units, you're probably gonna look at having one vacant at any particular period of time, or particularly if you start into 10 units plus. So that's just something to think about, but the returns can be really great. The last uh, strategy that you might use is, is rehabs, or what you might have heard the term fix and flip. Now, there's, I mean, the, the returns you can get here are great. These are, are chunk deals, or what we call you know, um, chunk returns where you get your return in one hit rather than over a year on year on year. Um, but, but either way, uh, the, there's a lot more work though and a lot more management in, in making it happen, but your returns can be great. I wouldn't do or I wouldn't recommend anybody look at a renovation or, or a fix and flip for under about 20, 25% return because there's a lot of work involved. Rehabs are a very active strategy whereas your multifamily and your single family are a much more passive strategy. So you wanna have a bit of a look at what sort of, what resonates best with you, but this gives you a really good idea as to the, the, the strategies you can look at. All right, so you say, right, Lindsay, I know where I wanna invest, I know what type of property I wanna invest in. How do I find a good deal now? Okay, well, that's a great question, let me show you. The first thing you want to do is you want to assess the property value. You want to make sure that you are paying a good price for this property. And the number one way to do that is to determine property comparables or, or what they would call comparable data analysis. So what you want to look at is you want to look at other properties that have sold in the same area of similar style, similar type, same number of bedrooms, same size, in the same condition. And you want to be very careful that you're looking at properties that are in the same condition. Now, so if you go around and you have a look at six other properties and you see that all these properties sold for, let's say $100,000, then you can suggest that the property you're buying is worth around about $100,000. Now, if you're paying less than that, then that's great. If the property needs work, then you need to factor in the cost of that work that's going to happen to make sure that you're not paying more than $100,000 for the property. So the comparable data analysis is very important. Probably one of the first things that I would do on, on any deal when I'm assessing the values. The second thing to be aware of, but also to look out for, is the online estimates. Now, you know, these can be really difficult. You wanna be very careful. There's a number of websites, and I'll go through those in a minute, that will give you some estimates of what they believe the property's worth. Now, the amounts that they give you is really only based on the historical value of properties that have sold in the area. Now, it doesn't take into account size of the properties. It doesn't take into account 
uh, number of bedrooms, it doesn't take into account the condition. And the condition is probably one of the most important things. If you get a property which is in really bad condition and it sells for say $50,000, and your property is in excellent condition and you're trying to get $150,000, the estimate might be because two bad properties have sold recently for 50,000, then it's telling you yours is worth 60. So that's not true. And the reverse can happen. If you're buying a property that's in really bad condition and all of the three or four properties recently sold in the area were in excellent condition for $150,000 and it's telling you yours is worth 100, when in actual fact, it's probably worth 50. You've got to be very careful. So the online estimates are something to be aware of, but also be cautious with. Here's the websites I was telling you about for US real estate. Now this is equivalent to our Australian websites of say domain.com.au or realestate.com.au. So you've got Zillow.com and you've got Trulia, spelt as you see it there, T-R-U-L-I-A.com. The last one is called Rentometer. Now this is a, a website that will tell you what properties will bring for rental. So something else really good to check. You wanna make sure you've got your rent numbers well when you're doing your feasibility studies. You see, you know what you're gonna be able to get for the property in rent. And that can either help you in firstly your cash flow if you're gonna keep it, or if you're going to tenant it and sell it as an investment property, you wanna make sure you know what that investor's cash flow is gonna be who, you, who buys the property from you. And the last thing I was just saying about before about was your minimum return targets. So you wanna make sure you hit those. 10% I believe is a minimum return target net after all costs for a rental property. If you can't get 10% as a rental, then I think you're probably not looking at the right deal. There are a lot of opportunities to get around about that 10% net rental range. You wanna, you wanna make sure you're building that in so you can allow for changes in exchange rate, you can allow for changes in market fluctuations, and you've still got plenty of profit. So you wanna look for around about that 10%. On a renovation or a rehab, I, I look at around about a minimum of 20%. That's where I draw the line in the sand. If I can't get a 20% return target for a renovation, then I won't buy the property. Or I'll offer whatever amount I need to to make sure I can make a minimum of a 20% a return. Here's some handy calculators for you so you can look at um, whether a, a, a property is of good value or not. At the end of this, if you want to send us a, a, an email or something like that, you can contact us on our website. Um, I can send these to you. This one's called the Maximum Allowable Offer Calculator. So what it does is it allows me to put in the after repair value or the market value of the property, what we believe the repair cost might be, a few of the other holding costs we allow um, basics for. Uh, so you can see there we've got the minimum profit target of 20%. So this is telling me for a particular property which is worth $75,000 once complete, if the repair costs on that property are gonna be 15,000 to bring it up to market, then I need to be able to offer at, at a maximum of $38,940 to be able to make 20%. Generally, what I would do from negotiation is start at around about 70 to 80%. So I'd start at about $30,000. So if this property was on the market and say they were trying to sell it for 45, I'd be probably making an offer of saying, look, we'll do a cash offer of $30,000. Now they may not agree to that, but you could work your way up and you could get it for 35, 36, which is below your maximum allowable offer and it allows you the minimum profit margin of uh, 20%. So that's something that you can look at. Very handy little calculator. Second one is your rental return. So as I said before, you wanna make sure you use sites like Rentometer to determine that the rental return is accurate. But this one here, you buy the property for $43,000, the rental returns 850, You've got to allow for your any if any cleanup and rehab costs there of two and a half thousand dollars, and then you've got a property man, management maintenance and so on and so forth and 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 vacancy. That means that that property is going to give you a, a net rental yield of twelve point six percent. So in this particular case, that is a good deal, and that as a rental property, that would be a good one to buy. Ten percent is the number you're looking for. It needs to be greater than ten percent. All right, so let's get back to that uh, three-year plan, five investment properties, $10,000 uh, per property as a cash flow, which will give you a $50,000 per year bonus. Or the five-year plan, as we said, 10 investment properties at 10,000 per property is $100,000 per year cash flow injection into your portfolio. Now, both of those are very good. As we said before, what capital do you need to invest? Well, if you were looking at investing in Australia, well, that, that would be probably silly numbers. I mean, you'd look at that and say to yourself, well, if I could make $10,000 cash flow per property in an Australian property, you've done very well. And to buy five properties in Australia, if, if you aren't paying $4 million for those five properties, I'd be very surprised. 
maybe some country areas you might be able to do it. Uh, you could probably get $10,000 for cash flow from commercial properties, but uh, you won't be able to get them for anywhere near that sort of price. And 10 properties, you'd have to think, well, you've got to be kidding, Lindsay. How is someone supposed to be able to afford 10 properties? Even the deposit alone would be more than a million dollars. Well, that's where it's a little different. In the US, you can buy five investment properties that eat, that are going to give you a, at least or greater than $10,000 a year income net for less than $300,000. So 10 properties, less than $600,000. And that is less than a deposit on some properties here in Australia. You know, if you were buying a property for one, one and a half million dollars, they're gonna be looking at a, a deposit by the time you include stamp duties of around that $250,000 mark. So the US market is good, it's, it's really solid. It's got some, some great benefits to it. So let me show you one other strategy that we do use regularly, and this is something that we've had a lot of clients use. So I just wanted to show you this quickly, and it's called the cash generation strategy. So you, you might turn around and say, look, that, that your three year plan there, Lindsay, looks great, but I don't have $300,000. You know, I've got 50 or I've got 100, but, but how do I do that? Well, this is what we do. So what we do here is we, we buy a property. Let's say you pay $30,000 for this property and you spend $20,000 on doing it up, getting it up to market value. So your investment in this property is $50,000 all up. Now what happens is this property at 50,000 that you've spent on is now worth $65,000, okay? So this property has appreciated in value because you've done the renovations to it by 30% essentially. And then you sell it, so you get your $15,000 profit. What you do is you repeat that. So you go and buy yourself another property. Let's say this property you pay $20,000 for, a little bit cheaper because it needs more work. But this one needs to have $30,000 spent on it, so you're still up to 50,000. Once again, the property's worth $65,000 at the finish, which gives you a $15,000 return or 30%. You sell the property, you do it again. So you repeat the process three times. Now what you've got here is you can see here, You've got three properties, hopefully you can see my cursor. You've got three properties here that are giving you a profit of $15,000 each, which is $45,000. That $45,000 can go and buy you one property, which will give you a $10,000 rental return year on year, and you've still got your $50,000 investment that you started with. Now that whole strategy there can take you about 12 months, and you can have yourself your first rental property, and you've still got your $50,000. So then what you do is you repeat. So year two, you go and do the same thing again, and at the end of that, buy yourself a second rental property. Now year three, what you've got here is you've got one property that's earned you $10,000, another one that's, you've got two properties earning you $10,000, that's $20,000. Um, you earn another uh, $45,000, so you're up to $65,000, plus you've still got your 50,000 that you had, so you can go and buy two more properties. So what, what can we do for you? Essentially, we're here just to help in any way we can. We're happy to help you with strategies. We're happy to help you show them. We do a lot of training. We do a lot of coaching. We do a lot of support. What I have found and one of the things that, that is probably the most uh, passionate thing for me is being able to help people get into markets that, that they otherwise would not have been able to do. And there's so many pitfalls and there's so many scams out there around US property that that I, I, it's really rewarding when I can show people and help them avoid those issues. And that's really what we do. So we really do just help focus um, on Aussies building wealth through real estate in the US. We can help with sourcing properties for you. We can help with creating company structures to protect your assets, closing on properties, et cetera, et cetera. We have teams on the ground. We can help put you in contact with all sorts of different areas within the, the investing scheme that, that you can get help with. We can train you, we can teach you, we can support you through the whole thing. So, you know, training I think is probably one of the best things you can do and that's hence why you're here watching this training video. The, the training I think is, is crucial. You wanna learn as much as you can about this. Any opportunity you get to get into groups, to get into Facebook groups, uh, to get into investor groups, talk to people, um, go to seminars, go to meetings, go to workshops. You'll learn and you'll learn and you'll learn and you'll meet people who are doing it and, and they'll give you some hints and tips of what to do, what not to do. It's critical information. It really is good. Here's some examples for you. I won't run through these. You can see these uh, here on the screen. But 
you know, there's some really good examples here. These are actual properties that 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 have that clients have bought um, either through us or, or have told us that they've been able to buy. I mean, this one here in Pensacola in Florida was an excellent return. Uh, they paid thirty-four thousand dollars for this. Now in Pensacola, that's unheard of. That that was so cheap. Um, their rent was eight hundred dollars a month. Little two-bedroom place. But that was a fourteen percent return for them, and they've had that now for probably three years. Um, the tenant's still the same tenant right from the begin. So a fantastic little one. Let me also show you another quick video. I'll just switch across really quickly. So as you can see the before here, the property was not in very good condition. Pretty ordinary kitchen, basement. And this was uh, two months to renovate the property up to this standard. So the market value of this property was $80,000. So it gives you a bit of an idea on what's possible and, and these are properties that have been done by, by people just starting out. So there you go, that gives you an, an idea of what's possible. Um, you know, that, that video there was a, a property that was finished around about uh, three or four months ago, um, tenanted, sold as a tenanted investment property, uh, took around about sort of three months from start to finish. Uh, you know, and, and that is a very, very typical example um, of the, and the numbers that you saw there were, were uh, are very uh, indicative of what you can get. So the next step, look, I, I would really just suggest um, touch base with us. Um, you know, see if there's anything that we can do to help. Um, would love to, to sort of help you on your, on your investment portfolio or on your journey into US property. Um, you'll get another email coming after this training video um, to have an a, opportunity to join our investors in a circle. That, that's a really good way of being able to network with other investors to set up joint ventures. Um, you'll have access to our team on the ground in the States. It, it's, it's priceless, it really is. Uh, I can't I can't say highly enough that training and and knowledge and information is really what it's all about. And you know you can see there they were saying never was anything great achieved without fear. Well, what is fear really? But the lack of knowledge of something. You you know we always fear the unknown. Once we know more about it, then then the fear is not not such an issue anymore. So get in, learn what you can. If there's anything we can do to help, please let us know. Jump onto our website there. You can see it in the center of the screen there, www.startdynamic.com.au. We've got some blogs. We've got some, um, some training pieces. There's all sorts of stuff you can get onto. Hope you enjoyed this. Um, if you're not already in our mailing list, uh, jump on and download our ebook. Get in our mailing list. We send out a lot of training information and that sort of stuff on, on the US market. So don't miss out.